Hello and welcome to another lockdown learning session with Gary Gundry and Dave Austin from Learning Lounge. Today we're going to take a look at AFDDs. Not so much how they work because that's been done quite a lot, we'll touch on it, but mostly the implementation of them, isn't it guys? That's what we really want to concentrate on is why and when would you use an AFDD? What, what do the regs say about this Gary? Let's start off with that. Okay, the regs only have a couple of sentences. And you can see in regulation 421.1.7, art fault detection devices conforming to a particular standard are recommended as a means of providing additional protection against fire caused by art faults in AC circuits. So this is where the questions come through to the helpline normally to say it's only recommended. If that's recommended, do I need it? Should I install it? Do I do it for one circuit, multiple circuits or the whole installation? And the, there isn't a definitive answer we can give is there really I mean I know when that first came out in the document for public consultation uh, for the 18th that said uh, may didn't it and then may it, was firmed it, up to recommend it yes it was either going to go down one way or the other which was it has to be sort of mandated so it was going to be a shall or like you said it ended up as a recommended and that was a sort of uh, a meeting of minds to be uh, a, a step into the uh, program of where it was going to go because you know when you talk about your arc yeah well i was just about to say my arc my famous arc the the arc arc uh, because i saw this with spds i've talked to you about this before i think i've mentioned it before that you know, i saw it come in in 2008 we saw it in the 17th and we saw this very small hinty mention just a wisp on the wind it was of something coming down the line called a surge protective device and then here we are now with pages and pages where they're pretty much expected to be fitted in most installations at some point or other um, and I think we're going to see the same with AFDDs. I think we're, we're just getting a hint here. But one of the reasons I suspect that it was held back was partly because we didn't really have the devices, did we? When this, when this was all being talked about, we only had devices that were uh, dueling up on an MCB or an RCD or an RCBO. We, th th there was no single unit device at that time, was there? No, you had to sort of lock them together, didn't didn't you? Yeah. You would sort of uh, an AFDD, and it would either tandem and link in with a, an RCD, or it would be a circuit breaker. So these were quite chunky units, and I think you're right. I think manufacturers were getting ready to do that for the UK market. In America, for example, they've had these for years, so they're not new. Uh, no, no, they're, not, they're called these, arc, these are... arc fault circuit interrupters in America. So yeah. if, you, if, you, if you Google them in, in American stuff, you'll find a different name for them. So don't, AFDD doesn't work. It's uh, arc fault circuit interrupters. But yeah, you're right. They're widely used. And indeed in Germany. I think that one of the things there was that there's lots of wooden buildings. Isn't that the reason? That it's, the, yeah. it's the construction? It is the construction of that. I mean, in the UK, we have a lot of brick built buildings. But in America, for example, half the states um, had, it, had it and they realized that there were fires. And generally, um, a lot of kit extension needs, lots more equipment tucked into that. And there was a fire risk, and it helped to eliminate that and obviously save, save on um, building regeneration and uh, save lives as well. So let's just clarify where they fit in. Can you bring up that first slide, Gary, uh, the one that shows the, the pyramid? Let's just have a look at that, and we'll talk through where they fit in the hierarchy of stuff. So, yeah, we got that. So you've got your basic, basic protection provided by insulation, and then fault protection, which is overcurrent by and large, which is the MCB, miniature circuit breaker, or sometimes an RCD, and then the additional protection, the earth fault protection provided by the RCD. But the thing that the, neither of those can touch is where there is an arc fault in the circuit, because in the arc fault, there's usually at least no more or sometimes less current flowing so you don't get an mcb tripping and there is no fault going to earth by and large if it's certainly if it's a serial fault then nothing will be picked up by either of those devices so the arc fault protection is the top of the pyramid there that finishes that circle or that that pile of protection on every possible fault really that could occur on a circuit so that's why these things have started to come in and it's mostly to do with fire protection because what is generated when there is a fault is heat, sometimes very large amounts of heat, and they, that heat, is what causes a fire, and that is the problem, because if you don't know the arc faults there, it can be gently cooking away until suddenly it combusts. So that's why we've added these into the armory, and there's that beamer guide there, if you, if you do need to know more, that beamer guide has yeah, got so everything you need. 
the latest edition, and it's on its third edition, was issued on October 2019. They're free to view, so uh, go on to the internet and look this up and you better download it. Now, if you look at the next slide, we can see that th these are the sort of double units that first appeared when uh, AFDDs were introduced. In fact, these are more sophisticated because the first units were literally two units bolted together. There was the device, the MCB or the RCD, and that was interlocked mechanically using the AFDD, which literally was screwed onto the side of it. Those are actually bespoke double units. I think they're reasonably current. But what the manufacturers have done now, if we look at the next slide, Gary, is they've slimmed them right down, and we've now got single units. So you can see that Wilex set up there, the MCB, the RCBO, and the AFDD stroke RCBO, so it does everything. That, that really is a, a super unit. Mind you, it comes at a fairly chunky, chunky price, doesn't it? <laughs> they're not cheap. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, they're not. I mean, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, and he said, if you just go on to a particular uh, wholesaler that we know of, uh, they're about £200 each. I do believe that you can get them a little bit cheaper than that. And obviously, if you're buying in bulk, you probably do a bit of a saving. But and yeah. I'm going to say the big <laughs> obvious danger here is that these the counterfeits will start to appear of these there's i mean it's un unquestionably maybe not at the moment because of what's going on but in a in a while when these things start to become more popular watch out for counterfeits if you're offered a, a cheap one significantly cheaper watch out for it being counterfeit because yeah. there's a oh. lot going on in there and in fact uh, our friends uh, joe and gary over at uh, efix who put out some superb videos uh, they had a lot of fun taking one apart because joe particularly says in the video I want to see what's not in it. So without their permission, thanks guys, we've nicked a slide from, <laughs> from their video. This is just a frame go from their video. One frame and I say, suggest we go and watch the video because it is very good. It's, quite it's cool. very, very good and it's very amusingly done. And they take this apart bit by bit until they find out what's inside it. Now you can see there, that's a slice through. And Joe's comment that I want to see what's missing because this unit feels very much lighter than an MCB or an RCD, or certainly an MCB with all the metalwork inside it. Because the thing about the AFDD, this is an RCBO by the way, so this is doing everything. And Gary, you flipped over, or it was flipped over in the video. Can we see the other one? Yep, I'll uh, just show you that now. I This is the bigger coil for the fault current, and there's the biometallic strip. And oh, right, so that's the fault current coil, is it? That's the fault current coil, that side. That, that's the yeah. fault current, the oh, other okay. one's the RCD. Right, in fact, right. I was looking, if I just go back, you can, when looking on the video, just about here is where the toroid is for where the current passes through to detect the RCD. So there's right, quite a okay. lot going on here. There's that so, uh, now, those are the two functions which providing which are which currently exist. The bit that we're sort of interested in is the circuit board, because actually the AFDD itself is none of that mechanical clunk. The AFDD is the circuit board which is comparing the waveform on the circuit to try and decide if it's displaying the waveform of a potential arc or an actually actual arc and when we did our 18th edition course at the learning lounge we did a whole load on afdds because we saw apart from the fact it's a very exciting subject we saw the oh, potential of these things and we made a very good video about it and we've taken a frame grab that's the next slide i think or the one after this one um and that's a frame grab from it and that just shows you the sort of factors that that board is looking at we're not going to go into them here because it's been covered before uh, and it's covered in our video in fact so we're not going to talk about them but you can see things like the duration of the incident how long did the actual arc occur things like that are what it's looking for and it will only trip when all five in this case this particular model has five all five of those are accounted for right gary's wobbling the mouse there you can see that little section in the center that's the only point where they all intersect where the thing will trip it's very discriminatory and it does not fault trip but i think there's a more interesting uh, indication from that beamer guide guys just turn go to the beamer guide slide because I, I grabbed this from the beamer guide now you can see there a very very characteristic waveform pattern that's being generated by the arc. And you can see why, because the arc forms. It's like if you're arc welding, if anybody's ever done that, you know, you touch onto the item, it strikes the arc, the arc then burns. And sometimes the arc will carbonize and it will then quench itself because the resistance of the arc actually becomes too high. That stops it momentarily. And then the current starts again. And you get this very characteristic waveform. And that is what the AFDD comparator is looking for all the time, monitoring the circuit. And if it sees that, style of waveform it will trip the circuit and we have a, a very short video which we've taken from a Siemens site it's just a section from a video do you want to run that now guys let's see action so there we go so this is a laboratory situation no this is, laboratory. this is all about it's all set up so you, there you go they turn it on they turn on the fans so we've got an mcb protecting it and you can see that the mcb does absolutely nothing because as far as it's concerned there is no overcurrent 
and eventually the heat builds up at that junction where the arc is happening and the fire occurs. Now, if you put an AFDD into that circuit and do exactly the same test under exactly the same circumstances, see how quickly that AFDD uh, trips, kills the current, and consequently the fire doesn't occur. So that's, that's how these things work. That's what they do. So Gary, how do we decide where they should be recommended? Okay, I'm going to take you back to uh, BS7671. When I took you to the regulation there, that basically just pointed out that it was recommended. Uh, most people seem to stop there, but unfortunately, the way the regulations is set out is that we need to go to the next page. All right, so that was at the bottom of page 80. This is at the top of page 81, so it's split. So you could easily miss it if you weren't looking too deep. Now, if used, an IFDD should be placed at the origin of the circuit to be protected. Well, that makes sense because obviously anything downstream, so the internal wiring connections, any load and extension links, is all protected. Now, for those that are familiar with the draft of public comment, um, it encompasses a lot of regulations. Uh, it may not have all the words that we see in the final publication. And these words in the note were, are in the harmonised document, so they appeared later than some number of you would have seen these, and um, it's seen as being a benefit and a little bit more explanatory. But the thing is, it then opens up uh, a big debate about what's needed and what's not. So looking at this, there are five examples here. So premises with sleeping accommodation. Now, when I was on the committees, oh, uh, I'm going to say six or seven years ago, they uh, internationally would come down with the words, Bedrooms. So as soon as you use the word bedrooms, everybody thinks, oh my gosh, you need these for every house in the country. So there was needed to be a modification there. So we can look at the sleeping accommodation element in a second. Then you've got the next one, which is locations with risk of fire due to nature of processed or stored materials. So if you have a lot of installations in barns, woodworking shops, all these are going to be flammable areas and obviously can catch fire easily. So it's a good idea to protect against them. Um, as I say, the wooden buildings are there. Fire propagating structures are sort of uh, high-rise buildings where it's easy for the fire to spread. And the best one I find is, is, is the most logical is if we've got any locations with endangering or irreplaceable goods. So it's a museum, art gallery, or something like that. If you, you know, these 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 things are priceless. You can't ever get them and get back again. So that two hundred pound saving, uh, sorry, that two hundred pound investment, it seems like a, a fantastic. Thing to protect your goods but it so what, where this seems to be pointing a lot though guys is that it's it's mostly commercial stuff really isn't it it's, it's hinting that commercial stuff places hotel places libraries galleries that sort of thing as you say yeah, but that's where they're really recommended aren't they well, it, it, yes and 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 no because if you if you have a barn all right say say you live in a wooden barn or, or a, a grade two or, or, or grade one listed building i would certainly want something like that if it was potentially risk of fire. Um, so your, so your it, risk assessment is, is really based around the propagation element of a fire. If a fire breaks out, how quickly would it spread and what damage could it do, is what you're saying, really. Because yes, I'm, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this. Why would, how could we ever rec not recommend where there's any chance that the fire could break out and cause life? Okay, well, Possibly I'll life. just put my cards on the table, as they say. I think these devices are lifesavers. I mean, you're, you're asleep for a third of your life, okay? So if anything- Or longer in my case. Uh, longer, <laughs> well, okay. Um, for, for typically we sleep that amount, so unconscious for a considerable amount of time. And whilst nobody recommends in the industry to put your appliances on, they do come on in the, in the early hours of the morning, say like a dishwasher or a washing machine to save on that. My fridge freezers on overnight, I've got my set top boxes. I mean, I'm not suggesting- And, and so just to clarify, when, when I'm not trying to, uh, simplify this too much but the fact is if you've got a loose connection in a, a plug let's say let's say the the line connector the the screw has become loose and it's not making perfect connection what you're suggesting is as that current load comes on that's when an arc could be a problem it, it can do and as i say i'm not a scientist in this and i've seen all of the data and we've, in our videos and we've kindly shared some material from eaton and, and other manufacturers to sort of demonstrate the benefits of these and that's the thing is that you know, I, I like to use car analogies on this, is if you can buy a basic model, but if you want all the extra bells and whistles, you know, like blind spot monitoring, lane navigation, control and that, these are devices that will help make uh, your life and living and your installation much safer. So from my point of view, uh, if I was gonna upgrade a board, I, I wouldn't hesitate to do that. The only thing is, is the cost versus benefit basis. And uh, when you're talking about an individual, 
it's okay, you know, like your own property, but if, you, if you're a social housing uh, provider, for example, and you've got tens of thousands of these in your portfolio, it's, it's going to get expensive. So you've got to weigh up, is there a risk or, and what can benefit from that? And now, you and I, have, uh, we have dis we, we've discussed as a concept how you might be able to use these in the way that an RCD, on a split board, an RCD is used to protect the bank of entrance fees. We, it couldn't really be done. That that um, highest current on that top range one that we saw on the chart back yeah, there, back that, yeah. 40 amps, wasn't it? So 40 amps would potentially protect lighting circuits, I'd say, but you, you could certainly couldn't use that to group protect some... Well, interestingly, some you know when we have split boards at the moment, so we have a main switch, an RCD, several breakers, then another RCD and several breakers, there was a lot of uh, suggestion that why couldn't we have an RCD, AFDD there, and it could protect multiple circuits? Mm. But you see, the limiting factor is 40 amps, so 40 plus 40, that's 80, probably could do that with an installation. But the bottom line is, these devices trigger the RCD, or they trigger the circuit breaker when they would set the units. Obviously, now we've got the Yeah, it's not so relevant now. But what you wouldn't so, know, because these, these things are quite sophisticated, and they will tell you when they've tripped, why they've tripped. They self-test, <laughs> but they also tell you why they've tripped. If you've got them on a group of circuits, you'd never know which one was faulty and what had caused the tripping. So no, it's not right. advisable, is it? No, not advisable. No, and how would you link them across the circuit? So it is, it is an, unfortunately, or, you know, one, one unit per circuit here. But mm -hmm. when you mention the, um, the indicator there, um, just about here, if you can see my mouse moving there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there a, an LED in there? And they flash once, twice, and they can tell you whether it's a series fault, or a, a parallel fault. It's overheated. There's, you know, there's got a, a lot of pointers there that is, you know, it's fantastic really to sort of. Yeah, but I mean, I've seen quite a lot of skepticism saying, well, they're not supposed to be um, tested, but how do you know they're still working? But they do self-monitor and they will pull up a fault condition if if they see one in themselves. Yeah, they are mini computers, really. They're pretty bright. So what have we got now, Gary? Well, this is exciting. What's all this? Well, you were yeah, you were touching on the um, the designer, the installation designer, talking about sort of doing a risk assessment here, and it'd be worth you know sort of seeing what the perceived uh, benefit would be. Uh, okay. What Newton's tripping? Obviously, what we don't want is if you have multiple circuits, you know, it could be a problem for that. But as I say, uh, in in essence, many things have to happen. So if you if you've never looked into this, you know, electric drill, the arcing and sparking on on some motors, some people think it will cause a trip, but it, it doesn't because you have to. It get doesn't. These, it doesn't do that. Um, and what have we got there? So this is all from the ECA, by the way. So if you're an ECA contractor, you know, certainly download these data sheets, and it would uh, help to do that. But the um, idea is it is uh, it's per circuit basis. So if you've got eight, 10 circuits, you know, 200 pounds, you know, you're looking at you know, a considerable investment. And now, the future, Gary, before we finish, what do we think? I mean, you, you may or may not know, you can never, we can never prize it out of you, but what, what, no, what, do, we, what do we think is coming down the line? Okay, well, I definitely think that uh, we should look at these um, for situations where there are risk of fires, like larger buildings. So you've got your high rise residential buildings, some of them call them high risk. Um, we've had some tragic accidents in the last few years. So anything to help save lives is always got to be a good thing in my mind. So um, I should suggest that when Amendment 2 comes out, we will likely to be seeing changes. And as you said about that arc, you know, it was a recommended. So that might be certain circuits, others will be recommended. And then ultimately in 10, 20 years time, it will be the default one. To, you, you, you won't be fitting um, a circuit break anymore. You definitely have, I mean, at the moment, lots of people want to fit RCBO. So it's going to be AFD, RCBOs. And mm. So having all of that protection in one little device has got to be the way forward. It's just got to be managed because it is a considerable expense. And I'm sure that if it does come out in, in amendments, uh, in future amendments, uh, and anybody wants to have their say, get in there, please, and, and write in your comments. Don't be frightened of sending in. Everything is reviewed and everything's considered. I know. It's, like, it's like sitting in the office with you, Gary, this, listening, watching every word, thinking, what's he saying? What's he, where's the hint? Where's the hint? Uh, what's coming? What's coming? <laughs> well, Amendment 2 is, is on its way. It's uh, been, been done, and um, I know it will be out possibly later this year. Hopefully, obviously, we're in an uh, awkward situation at the moment. So but the plans are, it's, there's, a, there's a schedule, so things are coming, and uh, I showed you the regulation number, so if you, if you want to get in there, because it's all viewable, dr drill down there and find that, and that will be one of many changes, uh, suggested changes. Uh, and we can't say it's coming, because obviously it's the same with the industry, what's available, and like that. But yes, your arc that you're predicting, 
I'm not. Different. I'm not a million miles wrong, is what you're saying. <laughs> I, I, we can always expect changes to come. And <laughs> the break oh, slippery Gundry. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Hope you've enjoyed that. We certainly enjoy doing these things, and um, we may even keep doing them when the lockdown finishes. Who can say? But thanks very much for that. There'll be more lockdown learning coming down the line. Watch all the other great stuff that's out there on the web because it's a really great time to take the opportunity to, to bone up on the knowledge and dig around in some subjects that you just normally don't get time to look at. And if you've got anything you'd like us to look at, then please contact us, Calling All Electricians, on the Facebook page. Send us a request and we'll happily chat about it for a few minutes for you. Uh, so until we see you next time, take care. Bye-bye.